to the full view. Tourism month has come and gone, but the focus remains on the sector that is of crucial importance for the South African economy. Tourism Minister Derek Hanekom has welcomed the relaxation of visa regulations that made it harder for families with children to travel to South Africa. This month, South Africa will implement a number of visa-related reforms that uh, Home Affairs says will make it easier for those tourists and for business people to enter the country. Uh, Hanakom has also welcomed the stimulus plan announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa with a focus on tourism. The minister joins us in studio now. Thank you for being with us. Thank minister. you, Francis. So it's not surprising that you're happy about the visa mm. regulations being dropped. I, th I think you were complaining about those years ago. Well, we were negotiating changes, but the changes didn't really come. Uh, the change that did come, of course, I, for a period I wasn't the Minister of Tourism anymore, and now I've yeah. returned. And um, we've uh, but returned under very different under very different circumstances, and with very good working relations with the Department of Home Affairs with my counterpart Minister Gaba. And so we went back to the drawing board. We said, where were we in 2015? What was the cabinet decision? And let's work together to try to implement these cabinet decisions. Mm. Is that relationship really okay? He's the same minister who implemented those reforms that you said would be a deterrent. Well, I can only uh, judge the minister that I work with in terms of the quality of the work that we do together right now. Um, I think uh, the period during which the minister Gigaba was a minister of finance probably, you know, gave him a lot of exposure to the our economic challenges, the economic challenges of our country. And I think the recognition that uh, tourism has a critical role to play in helping our economy grow, and that's how he enters, and that's, mm -hmm. we, that's his stance at the moment as Minister of Home Affairs, to try to find the balance between our country's security interests, which are legitimate, and including the uh, looking, uh, ensuring that we participate in the global effort to combat child trafficking, but to find the balance between that and ensuring that the uh, measures that are in place are not unnecessarily restrictive and don't impede tourism growth. Yeah, the, the, the fact is this took three years. Uh, the fact is if this really saved children's lives, we wouldn't have dropped the unabridged uh, birth certificate. That was one of the most onerous things. So it was the wrong intervention. But does that make you sad? No, I, what makes me happy is that we're now uh, embarking on a different program. We're now making the right interventions. Mm. So, uh, yes, a bit of time lost. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons. But what matters now is that we do the right things and that we get tourism growing. Okay, By so the way, even, even with these uh, restrictive measures, in 2017, tourism grew pretty well. The first half of this year, not that well. But the biggest factor, in fact, was not uh, visas, was the drought in Cape Town, was the biggest single factor... Um, putting a dampener on tourism growth this year yeah. at least. What sort of impact, I understand <coughs> you want to move forward, mm -hmm. uh, work with your uh, colleagues, but what sort of impact did this have? Because uh, according to what I've seen, uh, tourism from the Middle East, New Zealand, yeah. going down by 30%. That means billions were lost over three years. Again, you know, we can focus on how much was lost over the three years. I'm saying, have you quantified it? Can you give us any idea? No, it's very difficult to say how much of it was lost because of the visa regime. We can look at certain countries, uh, and they are good case studies. New Zealand, you, you mentioned, is a very good case study uh, because South Africa introduced a visa, or rather imposed a visa on travelers from New Zealand coming to South Africa in response to New Zealand imposing a visa on South Africa. I don't think it's the right way to go. We, mm. should, we should do what's in our best interest. But uh, in the year following the introduction of a visa, tourist arrivals from New Zealand dropped by 24%. By contrast, there was a visa waiver for Russia, and Russia in the year after the visa waiver, it increased by 52%. Sure. So visas do play a very important role, that's quite clear. But quantifying you know, exactly to what extent, because tourism grew during this period. How much more it could have grown, I'm afraid we don't have any research that can indicate to us with any exactitude, with any pre precision, uh, what, what difference it made during that period. We do know that one of the ways that you get more tourists to come to your country is to make it easier for them to come to the country. That is why this is not just a matter of child travel. This is a package of measures that will most certainly make it a lot easier 
for people to travel to South Africa. Just, just before we move away from the child travel, uh, some tourist groups were still concerned, saying there's not enough clarity here. Um, yeah. and, and I spoke to Home Affairs the day after. They were saying they're going to come out with a list of recommended documents yeah. that you still need to carry if you're a parent, uh, a single parent with a child. But would you get on a plane if there are a whole lot of recommendations, if you're really not sure on the other side, if you could be sent back? So surely there's, there's stark clarity needed there. Um, I think clarity will be obtained in, in sort of more, more precise terms or in more detailed terms as we go along. But the measure that was announced is exactly what the USA, UK, Germany, Canada and many other countries do. Um, that is, they, they don't require the documents and that is the big change since 2015, mm. where you as a, a single parent traveling with a child uh, would be required to get a, a certified copy of um, your, the, the other partner's permission, consent, uh, you'd have to have the, the what was called the unabridged birth certificate and a number of documents just to allow you as a single parent to travel with your child. So the, this, uh, this changed uh, provision which will have to be given effect in the, in the amended regulations um, means that you will be, and it is, it is exactly what UK, Canada and the USA do, you will be advised that in the event of any suspicion if you're traveling, for example, with a child and the child looks nervous, 14-year-old girl traveling with you mm. who doesn't have the same name as you, doesn't even look like you, and there are grounds for suspicion, then the, the uh, immigration officer may require you to prove the relationship between yourself and the child that you're traveling with, which is right. Um, so, sure. in the, you know, different, different circumstances, of course. In the event of, of a child traveling with two parents, with both parents, no documentation at all will be required or we will be requested unless there's something, uh, let's say, unusual. For example, if the, if the name of the parents is not the same as the name of the child, uh, there might be an, an explanation for that. But they, the, in, in those unusual circumstances or rare circumstances where two tra parents are traveling with a child, the immigration officer may say, well, could you just explain? Uh, or could you, could you furnish us with information? What happens in those other countries, they say, under normal circumstances, we, we aren't going to ask any questions. However, there, if there's some reason for us to, to have any kind of suspicion, we may ask you to prove the relationship between yourself and the traveling child or the traveling children. Okay, so you can get on the plane, but at That's least right. there's sort of a global benchmark of, of what to look out for now. Absolutely, and even then, when you arrive, you're not going to, and, and there's a document missing, if they ask you the question, they will give you opportunity. This is our agreement with Home Affairs, as is the case in other countries, mm. where you're, you're strongly advised, in the event that there's any suspicion, you will not be simply uh, put on the next flight home. You'll be given opportunity to obtain the documents or to explain the circumstances. If you're able to explain to the satisfaction of the immigration officer, uh, you'll be allowed through. Critical, uh, though, is, is the training of the immigration officers, that they, that they have a sense of what are the things that trigger suspicion and how do you deal with the situation once there is suspicion. So firstly, clarity on which documents are required. Uh, children traveling on their, on their own will be required to carry birth certificates and other documents, but children traveling with both parents will not. Uh, children tra traveling with one adult who may be a single parent or not uh, would be advised to carry a letter of consent from the other parent or guardian, as the mm -hmm. case may be. All right. So so we're is now it, global is it, benchmarking. Is it sort of clearish. Yeah, yeah. This clearish. is. It's making a lot more more okay. sense uh, <laughs> as we get there. Th mm. There's something else I, I want to focus on before uh, we we let you go, which is crime stats. I, I mean, is is that one of the biggest things that that you deal with? We have this beautiful country, uh, but but people want to know they can land. They want to know they can walk in the streets. They want to know that they'll be safe. Yeah, uh, Francis, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are many things that facilitate against tourism growth and against the econ economic growth in general, by the way. But just, just one last message on the, on the visas. I had a good meeting with the industry this afternoon. By the way, I mean, we've been working together very closely over a long period. Um, I, I, think we, I think clarity is being obtained. I think mm. there was a bit of confusion. I think that confusion is largely out of the way. At this stage, we're going to focus on messaging so that we, we give clarity to travel operators, to tour operators, travel agents, and that we send, send out a single message. So we had a really good meeting saying at this stage, it's, it's, we've got to take advantage of what is a positive development in tourism. Yeah. On the crime issue, of course, it can, you know, including public protests taking a particular form, 
can never be good for tourism. These kinds of images projected around the world can't be good for tourism. But, you know, way outside of my domain, one thing that we are doing, which uh, we're doing closely with the Minister, Ministry of Police, is taking at least key tourist areas, um, popular tourist areas. We've got in this financial year, we have 1,400 peop people called safety monitors that will be placed in these on some hiking trails, urban precincts, beaches, so that you at least keep some places you can say with confidence that this area is actually really safe for tourists. Mm -hmm. I should say, Karin, not Ms. Ach Francis, not notwithstanding, uh, um, you know, the, the, the harsh reality of crime and the crime statistics that we have, most of the places that tourists typically visit are actually really very safe. But it's, it, it's uh, communicating that, like you, you I say. Um, I mean, if, if the news of Westbury gets out, it's hard for people overseas to look yes. and, and know that there's going to be areas where I'm safe and areas where I'm not. Is, is that part of messaging as well? Well, what we, what we won't Although do... Although you don't want to say no-go areas either. Uh, it's exactly. Difficult. I mean, there's, there's also credibility of message. I mean, we're not going to pretend everything is fine. We know that we've got hard work to do to get everything fine, not just in the interests of tourism, but the interests of our own citizens. So combating crime has to be high priority for ourselves, mm. for the sake of our own country. But, uh, you know, if they are, you know, we will send out the message, of course, not trying to g send out any false message, but that what happens in Westbury is not necessarily your experience when you're at the waterfront in Cape Town or you, when you go to our national parks. We don't have public protests in our national parks and the well-visited tourist areas, tourist sites, as I say, are relatively safe. In fact, by most international standards, very safe. If you compare you know, our beaches with some popular beach countries, if you like, with coastal tourism, I don't want to mention country names, but we're a lot safer, our beaches are a lot safer than some other popular countries for mm. beach tourism, for example. What, what about AfriForum, who seemingly have gone on a global campaign to highlight uh, land expropriation without compensation? Something like that, a, a, an impact on tourism? Anything negative, anything said that is negative about un, our country has to have some negative impact on tourism. So AfriForum has not done our country a favor, has not done the land debate a favor, has not done Agri-South Africa a favor, and they've come out very clearly that they, they, you know, they, there's a good working relationship now between the presidency, ministers in cabinet, and farmers in South Africa, both black farmers and white farmers, to find a way you know, to, to give clarity to the notion of expropriation without compensation. I think it's becoming clearer as we go along. We know that uh, land reform is an imperative, it's not negotiable, uh, but we want land reform and that is the message that our president has sent out very clearly. Land reform which will not negatively impact on food security, on our economy, on jobs. So it's about you know, crafting a land reform program that delivers really good results, but without those negative impacts, avoiding those negative impacts. So expropriation without compensation in certain instances may well be justified. But it's not like, and the president made it very clear, there's no mass land grab that is envisaged in South Africa or will happen in South Africa. There'll be certain instances where expropriation without compensation is justified. In those instances, you have to have the tools to uh, proceed with such expropriations. Mm. All right, well, uh, here's hoping that tourism explodes. Thank you for your time. <laughs> uh, Minister yeah. of Tourism, Derek Hanakom. Remember that you can send uh, your comments uh, on this interview, on anything we're talking about tonight, including Westbury, uh, my colleague Bungani Bingwa on the ground for you. will return to that area. You can also send us your voice notes or video call us on 0664798056. You can view any of our interviews on sabcnews.com. And uh, let's listen to what some of you have been saying.